Welcome back to Module 7. In this video, we are going to actually return to a portion of Chapter 21 that we had skipped over when it showed up in Module um, 5. So we're going to be talking about how we look for other planets in other systems, so exoplanets, and compare to the information that we had already gained about binary star systems. We'll then get a better understanding of the current statistics and uh, missions that are working on this particular problem. So there are many different ways to find exoplanets. And it's useful to make the direct comparison with binary stars. So if we think back to the three types of methods for studying binary stars, we could take pictures, a visual binary system. We could uh, have the Doppler shift of the two stars spectrum. That was the um, spectroscopic binaries back in that chapter. And we talked about um, eclipsing binary systems where one star goes in front of and behind the other. So if we think back to binary stars, we have images, uh, the Doppler shift of spectrum, and um, transits, e eclipsing binary systems, where one thing goes in front of the other and we're looking at a light curve. With planets, it is very much the same kind of toolkit. The big difference is that we are looking at a big object that is also shining brightly, the one star, and a very small object that in many cases is not producing any light at all, even off of any kind of atmosphere, the smaller object, the planet. So some, very few, but some systems have been directly imaged, just like with binary stars. But very common techniques go back to Doppler shift of the spectrum, but in this case, it's only a one star that we're seeing, and it's called stellar wobble. We don't really need that phrase, but it's worth it to understand that it's um, changes in the radial velocity of the star. So stellar wobble or um, radial, radial velocity. And with the light curves, instead of eclipsing binary systems, we call them transiting exoplanets. But it's the same general idea. You're collecting all of the light, and when the planet goes in front of the star, it blocks some of the light. The link here in the posted slides uh, gets us to the NASA website on exoplanets, because this particular video is one that if I tried to list any statistics, they would be outdated almost instantly. So I will give us a small snapshot through um, in the uh, data set on the right of the screen, this is through the end of 2015. And um, on the left, we have through June of 2020. So again, these data sets are already old by the time that I'm recording this, but it gives us a sense of what methods are being used most often. So first of all, on the right, we have transit-based discoveries in yellow. And it's worth recognizing something really important that we'll be talking about in the next slide, that all of these points, the orbital period seems to cut off. There seems to be this maximum around 500 or 600 days where there just aren't um, planets anymore. And I, wanna, I want us to recognize something important in the next slide about why that is. That is based on our missions available, not on whether there actually are exoplanets there. But before I move on, I want to look at the um, bar chart real quick. Transiting exoplanets have been 76% of the confirmed cases of discovering exoplanets. And radial velocity, looking at that stellar wobble, um, has been about 19%. Those are the more common types of methods, just like with binary star systems. Okay, so why are transits so common a technique? And why does that orbital period cut off at about 600 days? It actually has almost entirely to do with a single mission, the Kepler spacecraft. The Kepler mission stared at a single patch of sky from 2009 to 2013, looking at the light curve of all of the stars in that patch of sky. 
A discovery requires three full transits detected because if you only have one transit, that's really nothing at all. That could have been any uh, number of reasons that the star could have dimmed momentarily. With two, now you have a, um, a candidate where you know how far apart they, those two dips were spaced. Maybe it's a coincidence, but now you can predict where to look for the next um, periodic dimming. And so that third transit gives us a much stronger confirmation that what we're looking at is probably something orbiting that star. Now, the official Kepler mission lasted for six years, and Discovery requ requires three or more transits. So, if we want to have Kepler be the one to confirm the statistic, the um, exoplanet discovery, it would require an orbit of no greater than two years because we had to have seen it three times. So if we go back a slide, three um, transits in six years worth of time fully explains that cutoff at 600 or 700 days. Most of these yellow points, not all, but most of them came from the Kepler mission. And as we've um, started to move on from that, the K2 mission for Kepler that had a span of time where it ran, um, we'll be adding more to this, but that's, that's why this particular graph has the shape that it does. Not because there aren't planets at small radius that orbit at large distance, but because of the, um, the Kepler data. Now, the other thing to be aware of is Kepler is no longer active. And when it was staring at a single patch of sky, its goal was not to find every exoplanet that exists. This was a small patch of sky. Instead, what it was trying to do is have a very, very strong statistical sample of looking at everything in that region and deciding how many stars had planets, how many of each size planet was, um, was there. And so Kepler gave us a very strong understanding of the statistical expectations of how stars and star systems with exoplanets should look. The biggest takeaway from the Kepler mission is that there are more planets than stars in our galaxy. So let's take a moment with that phrase, more planets than stars. If we think about our own solar system, the sun has eight planets, eight things that we are calling planets. But what that means is we could have six more stars that have no planets at all. And in the, that set of systems, there would be more planets than stars. So when you read statistics like those from Kepler, it is important for us to understand that Kepler is not trying to tell us that every single star has a planet, but that the odds are very good that on average, there's about a planet per star, but it's because they group up into, um, into systems of multiple planets. The other really cool thing from Kepler, and these two images are from chapter 21, is that the most common type of planet that was found, the size of the planet that was most common, is a size that's not actually in our solar system. Things that are rocky but slightly larger than Earth are called super-Earths. And things that are icy and gaseous, like the outer planets, that are smaller, slightly smaller than Neptune, are called mini-Neptunes. And so the most common size planet, size means physical, um, diameter size, the most common size is actually in between our inner solar system sizes and our outer solar system sizes, which is kind of interesting and, and weird. Now, the reason I want to specify size is because mass is a different quantity. If we have the size of an object, and let's say that it's maybe twice the size of Earth, we also need to know its mass to know, that if, to know if it's rocky, and we would call it a super-Earth, or whether it's icy, and we would call it a mini-Neptune. So really what we need is 
the mass and the radius. Now these different methods of discovery, transits and um, radial velocity, some of them are able to do both things, some of them can only do one or the other. And so the um, subset of planets that we have known mass and radius for is a smaller subset, and they're plotted here for the most part, and again, all of the graphs of exoplanet statistics in these slides are already going to be outdated by the time you're watching this, but they're, they're a good sense of where things have been. We have the planets in our own solar system in this graph as well. So there's two small triangles near one, that's Venus and um, Earth. The two small triangles near 12-ish are Uranus and Neptune. And then around 100 solar masses is Saturn, and around 300 solar masses is Jupiter. Jupiter's massive. And the blue lines are showing if something is completely made of iron, or completely made of rock, or completely made of water, or completely made of hydrogen, this is really where we expect the points to lie if it's a cold planet. What you'll see is that a lot of the points in this particular graph, planets that we were able to get both mass and radius for, are called, um, are in a category of planets that are called hot Jupiters. They have a lot of mass, more so than Jupiter in a lot of cases, and they're puffier. They are physically larger than Jupiter. That is because they are orbiting very close to their stars. These were some of the first types of exoplanets that could easily be discovered, especially through that radial velocity um, method, because they tug on their star um, quite a bit in a very measurable way. That doesn't mean that they're the most common type of planet. We just saw what the most common type of radius was. So, again, we're not going into the details because of the limited time in our semester, but when we are searching for an exoplanet, to know if it's like Earth, to know if it is an analog to Earth, we want to find a rocky planet. So we need mass and radius. But we also need that planet to be not too hot and not too cold in what's called the star's habitable zone. Very important phrase. The habitable zone is the range of distances over which liquid water would exist on that planet's surface. On the bottom of the picture here, we show our solar system. And Venus is right at the inner edge of the habitable zone, where if Venus had not so thick an atmosphere, a thinner atmosphere, it might actually be the right kind of temperatures for liquid water. And we see that Mars is kind of right on the edge of the outer part of the habitable zone. It's a little too cold for water, but if it had a thicker atmosphere, it might be warm enough to have liquid water on its surface. It does have um, water ice on its surface. And then Earth is nice and happy in the middle, like Goldilocks. For a smaller, cooler star like a red dwarf, shown here as the Kepler-62 system, that habitable zone would be closer. That smaller star is colder. You have to get a little bit closer to that colder object to be warm enough for liquid water. And this particular system has three planets that are extremely close to that small star. Uh, so for example, 62D here, that would be um, a star that is, or a planet rather, that is larger than the Earth, but way too close to be cold enough for um, liquid water to exist. And then the Kepler-62 system has uh, two planets that are mostly in the habitable zone that are mostly not too much bigger than Earth. And so they were one of the first um, kind of exciting potential Earth analogs that we found. All right, we said, I said that the Kepler mission is over, and it is, uh, and they've kind of passed, passed the torch over to the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And so TESS is a new survey mission with similar goals and a slightly different um, plan. But again, it is something where uh, if you go to exoplanets.nasa.gov slash TESS, you'll get a lot more updated information than I could ever hope to put on this um, slide. 
because when I'm putting this video together, Tess is fairly new, um, but it is in the process of gathering data and reporting on its discoveries. And so I'm, I'm excited to see where things have been and are going. Now, the last thing I wanna point out before I um, end this particular video is uh, another system um, that is worth watching the mission for, TRAPPIST. So in February of 2017, um, TRAPPIST-1 was the first discovery announced by the Transiting Planets and Plus Planetesimals Small Telescope. So this um, kind of cool vintage poster here is trying to show what it might look like from one of those um, planets that were discovered in this system. But this was a system with three um, Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone, seven Earth-sized planets total, around a red dwarf star. So certainly you can look up TRAPPIST-1 and see what has happened to it, what more we have been able to learn in the intervening years between 2017 and now. And it is um, kind of cool. These travel posters are completely free to download. Uh, and we have links here in the slide for Visions of the Future and the Exoplanet Travel Bureau, um, both from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So there's more coming out than I would ever be able to put in a kind of standing lecture video. This is a very um, fast moving and growing field of astronomy, uh, but I wanted to make sure to point out what things you might follow up on if you're interested in this particular topic. So in our remaining two videos for the module, we will be covering chapter 30, the last chapter in um, OpenStax astronomy, where we use this understanding of exoplanets and our own solar system to think about what the search for life really should look like. And that's our goal for those videos. So I will see you in those next two videos.